Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to our virtual conversation about COVID-19 and transplant and kidney care. These days, naturally, everybody is preoccupied with COVID-19, and so our panel today will link the concerns people have with the virus with people who suffer from kidney disease. What are the issues, the vulnerabilities, the, the treatments? Kidney disease is much more common than people think. And virus or no virus, the need to do research and have proper care is on the rise, coincident with increases in obesity and diabetes. I'm Tim Griffin, a volunteer for decades with St. Michael's Hospital and a director on the Hospital Foundation Board. And I'm also co-chair of our campaign for St. Michael's Kidney Transplant and Care Center, along with Nikki Eaton, whom you'll meet later. I will be turning things over to Christina Howron, uh, who is going to moderate the session. There she is. And uh, she's a journalist with City TV News. And she received a new kidney almost a year ago and has actually documented her journey from dialysis through transplant for City, City News. And you can, you can find that on Google. And now I'd like to, to introduce uh, Dave Ayers, who should come on the screen here. A uh, terrific guy whom everybody in Toronto got to know um, back in February when he was brought in as an emergency backup goalie for the Carolina Hurricanes. And what a great story that was, notwithstanding the fact that the Leafs lost, which was very painful for me. He is uh, he's also a transplant recipient at St. Mike, so he knows what he's talking about. We we'll look forward to hearing from you in a moment. Uh, next up, we're going to have Dr. Jeff Saltzman. Uh, he is the man of the hour, and uh, I consider him the spiritual leader of our campaign to build a much improved state-of-the-art kidney transplant and care center at the hospital. And last but not least, my co-chair, uh, Nikki Eaton, Senator Nicole Eaton, formerly, better known as Nikki, and she is a tireless advocate for the hospital with particular interest in kidney research and patient care. So thank you all for attending. We've had a terrific number of people register for this. It's going to be a great show. And I'll turn things over to you now, Christina. Thank you so much, Tim. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased to be moderating this very important discussion. Now, we've all watched as COVID-19 has shaken up healthcare, along with everything or virtually everything else in our lives. And I think those of us who are transplant recipients, along with those living with kidney disease, have a lot of questions. Like what are our risks for COVID-19 infection and for its complications? Can the virus cause more damage to our kidneys? What happens to transplant recipients, to people like Dave and I, and our care during this pandemic? Now I'll start a little bit with my own story. Now my transplant story started just over two years ago. I was covering a story um, out in Mississauga, hadn't been feeling very well for a couple of months, had some blood work done and I received two phone calls from my GP's office calling to say, um, they left me voicemails and then just said, you have to go to emergency room right now, you're kidney failure. And I didn't really believe them. Um, I'm very thankful that I had a cameraman who was like, we are not taking any chances here. He drove me to a hospital, he waited with me, um, we found until my partner arrived and then we found out that yes, I was indeed in kidney failure. I was really lucky. I worked with a great team of nephrologists. Um, they were able to help me stave off dialysis for a couple of months. I only had between six and 8% kidney function. So I had been living my life with like 8% kidney function. Um, and uh, while well, my mom, she started, thankfully was willing to start the testing to become my living donor. Uh, ultimately, I started doing PD every day at home. I was on that machine for 10 to 11 hours every single night while trying to juggle working as well and uh, pursuing my passion. My mom was ultimately deemed um, a not a suitable candidate, in part because of her advanced age. And without missing a beat, uh, my cousin Christine Hodgkinson, she immediately stepped up, raised her hand, and she said, let's start it with me now. Like, I'm up next. And she started that process. So... 
I was only on dialysis for nine months in total. Um, I had my transplant on June 13th of last year. And I remember I woke up and, you know, there was a little bit of like murmuring and some clapping and cheers in the halls of the hospital. And then all of a sudden I could hear it on the street and I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm alive. I made it. And those cheers were not for me. Um, they were for the Raptors who had just secured their first NBA championship, but uh, it kind of felt like all of the cheers on the streets really were for me. So that's when I got uh, my second lease on life and my beautiful gift from my cousin. Um, but my story, I mean, it's, it's, it's a common story for people that have gone through it to feel like they have this brand new lease on life. But I know that Dave, you almost had a similar situation when it came to finding out. It's not something that you had been anticipating for quite some time, right? Yeah, my kidney uh, issues, they started 17 years ago. And I was actually uh, practicing, kind of doing a couple training camps for hockey. Uh, couldn't fit my foot into my skates for the last one. They were so swollen. So I ended up going home. Um, and it was Thanksgiving. I was super sick. I ended up going to the hospital. And uh, little did I know, my kidneys were, were shut down. So um, right away, my mom was beside me, and she said the same thing. She said, let's, uh, let's get this testing started. Uh, where do I where do I sign up? So uh, she was all for it. Uh, I was on dialysis. I actually had to go into the hospital for mine three days a week, which wasn't bad because I did it on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and it happened to be NHL games every night. So while I was on dialysis, I was watching the hockey game. So uh, I was upset, but not too upset at that point. Uh, and I was as similar as yours. I had my uh, May twentieth. So just this past May twentieth was sixteen years for me, uh, and I was only on dialysis for about nine months as well. So. Uh, I got moved along pretty quick and uh, everything was great. So, you know, obviously, you know, I had that passion to play hockey and I wasn't going to let the kidney transplant uh, set me back at all. I, I was still actually playing hockey while I was on dialysis uh, a couple of days a week. And right after I said, you know, how long is it going to take me to recover? Uh, it didn't take me too long. I was back on my skates probably within a year and uh, ended up fighting my way back. And I got lucky enough to be in an NHL game this year. Well, first off, happy belated anniversary. So congratulations on that. But you said 17 years ago. So that means that you would have been going through dialysis, just doing some quick math here during SARS. So mm -hmm. during an actual pandemic. So what was that like? Because I'm sure a lot of people are experiencing that right now. Yeah, that was different. Uh, when I first found out, I was in the ICU for probably about 16, 17 days, uh, and you had no idea who was coming and going. Everyone looked the same. They were fully dressed up, and all you could see was their eyes through their uh, through the goggles. So uh, you didn't get a chance to talk to anybody. Uh, they were just kind of in the room and right out of the room. So you felt lonely. Uh, it wasn't exactly the easiest thing to go through, but uh, I'm sure people are doing it right now, and you just had to stay strong and kind of uh, build a goal for yourself. It's funny, you're using a lot of sports analogies and you're talking <laughs> about staying strong and building a goal right. for yourself and uh, yeah. you know, being a goalie. So how long after your transplant, because it's been 16 years now, but how long afterwards before you put those skates back on and we're back on the ice? Yeah, it was close to a year. I was actually supposed to go play uh, in Texas. I was at a training camp opportunity in Texas and that was supposed to start in September and my transplant was obviously in May. So I had lost probably 40, 45 pounds. I was down, I normally... 205 I was down to 160 um, so I definitely wasn't ready my mind was ready to go uh, but my body wasn't ready to go so I, I skipped that one for a year but uh, yeah it was probably less than a year I was back on the ice uh, trying to do my thing as best as I could but not, not that easy well see I know a lot of people um, even me when it came to after my transplant I was very concerned about what sort of workouts can I do you know you want to kind of protect your kidney bump so to speak I mean you've got pucks that are literally flying at you so how did you protect yourself? I know, I know that goalies wear a lot of gear, but how did you protect yourself? Did you have to take any extra steps? Yeah, that was one of my biggest fears, actually, when I started back. I thought my kidney was going to get hit, and uh, my fistula, actually, because it's in my left arm, uh, and that's a spot you get hit quite often when you're, uh, when you're playing goalie. So yeah. uh, I had that well protected. The, the people, uh, when I started with the Toronto Marlies, they made sure I was well protected. They gave me a guard. Um, and then for my kidney... Uh, you know, as a goalie, you wear quite a few layers over top of that. So it wasn't too bad. Uh, and uh, knock on wood, I've been able to take it off the chest and not the kidney. So <laughs> that uh, that's helpful. But yeah, you definitely have to be careful what you're doing. So were you able to, I know you said it took about a year before you were really back in the swing of things, but how did you train for that? Because I know the first couple of months post-transplant, it's, it's tough to move around. Yeah, I found uh, when I got out of the hospital, I had a hard time walking to the car. 
uh, and then sitting in the car driving home and you hit a bump and you're just, you know, it was painful. So at that point, I'm sure you've had the same thing where you're like, how long is this going to take? This is going to, this is going to take forever, but your body heals up pretty quick. You don't realize how good your body can heal uh, if you treat it right. So yeah, that's, that's what I did. I just tried to make sure, you know, uh, eat what I was supposed to drink a lot of water and, and try to get my body to hurry up and heal so I can get out there. Well, and that's one of the things that I found after my transplant, I had heard it, but I didn't really believe it that, um, once, once I had started to heal a couple months later, I was like, oh my gosh, this is how healthy people feel. I had no idea. It's like, I forgot what it was like to feel healthy. It's, it's just night and day. Yeah. I think the next day after my transplant, I had a bunch of energy, you know, I wanted to get up and walk around, but, uh, it wasn't easy. Um, but that's, you just have that energy it comes right back to you. And, uh, that's, there's quite the glimmer of hope when you all of a sudden you feel so much better. You're not sick to your stomach every day. You don't feel terrible really. Um, and you know, as well as I do, dialysis isn't the, the most fun, but once you get that transplant and you can get back to somewhat of a normal life, uh, that's when you take advantage of it. So that's your recovery, but how was your mom's recovery as a living donor? My mom is great. She, uh, she was out of the hospital, I believe in five days. And when I got out of the hospital, I, I saw her and she's outside gardening. So she was, uh, she was, she's a trooper and uh, she was ready to go. And uh, she's been great. You know, she has had no complications. And uh, right now she always says that's the best thing she's ever done in life is uh, donate a kidney to me. So that's special. How nice is that, eh? For a mom yeah, to give, fantastic. give life twice, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm sure that this is a story that, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Zeltzman is at least somewhat familiar with. I'm sure you've seen lots of living donors. Now, can you talk to us a little bit about how things have changed at St. Mike's now that COVID-19 has hit everywhere? Yeah, well, thanks, Christina and, and Dave. Um, I love Transfond because I love seeing the success uh, emulated by you two, uh, who've done both very well. It makes me very happy. That's why I like my job. But COVID has impacted everybody. And when it comes to kidneys, uh, we could look at a, at a number of aspects. Um, for kidney transplant recipients who are on lifelong anti-rejection drugs or immunosuppressive drugs, um, one has to be careful because kidney transplant patients don't get COVID any more frequently than anybody else, but there is a risk that if they were to get it, and some do, uh, their immune system would not be able to fight it off quite as well. So when we've had some patients who've gotten COVID and we've had to make some, some uh, changes to the anti-rejection medications. Secondly, and this has been a big impact at St. Michael's, but um, dialysis patients, they're the only patients throughout all of COVID that have had to come to hospital ongoing, nonstop, often three times a week or more, because they need dialysis to survive. And you can imagine dialysis patients, some of them are coming from long-term care facilities, some coming from, um, from on wheel trans in, in, in a crowded space. And... Um, and we had had COVID in many dialysis patients across Ontario. And we had an outbreak here at St. Michael's, which uh, had a huge impact on our staff, our nurses, uh, our physicians, and the patients themselves. Thankfully, we got through it. But I can tell you right now, in the province of Ontario to date, a dialysis patient who, who develops COVID has a one in five chance of succumbing to this, which is much higher than, than the general population. And, and that is the, those are the facts right now in Ontario since COVID started in, here in March. Um, and so those are the two big impacts. And the third is that um, for COVID patients who get really, really sick and end up in the ICU, even if they didn't have kidney disease, um, they are at high risk if they get kidney disease of doing very, very poorly. So COVID can attack the kidneys and lead to kidney failure. And we have patients right now in our hospital who have been on dialysis, who came in with normal kidneys for the last five or six weeks on ventilators and unfortunately another bad outcome. The other thing is, is that, you know, we've had to change some of our activity. Uh, our transplant activity had, had almost shut down for about eight weeks. We were doing only the very high risk transplants for a while, but in fact, we didn't do any for eight weeks. Uh, we've just started to open up our program about three weeks ago, and we've thankfully done some uh, kidneys from deceased donors. Right now, living donor, across the, living donor transplant across the province is on hold. And that has to do a lot with operating room time. There's a lot of operating rooms that have to come up to speed and there's competition for operating room time. As both of you know, when you do a living donor, you need two surgeries and two operating rooms, which um, is a precious resource right now in Ontario. So 
there's a lot of great things that, about St. Mike's and about its kidney transplant program, but can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that set you apart from some of the other transplant programs across Canada or North America? Yeah, so, you know, we just celebrated 50 years of being transplanted at St. Michael's, and that was a very proud moment for us. Um, we've done a lot of things that we're, we're really, really uh, excited about. We do a lot of clinical research. We've investigated drugs. We help develop uh, a vaccine for shingles that's safe and transplant through other partners. Um, we are looking at cardiovascular disease. We were the first program, along with Toronto General, to do a paired exchange donation where a donor, a living donor like you both had, but the donor was incompatible with the recipient. And we were able to swap donors, and that led to a national program which is one of the world's most successful programs. Um, we are the only program in Canada to do blood group incompatible donor uh, and recipient um, transplants using a very special uh, uh, column that's proprietary. And, and uh, we've had a lot of success in that over the last number of years. And some of our basic science researchers, uh, such as Darren Ewan, are doing tremendous work on scarring and fibrosis and understanding how that affects both native kidney native kidneys and and kidney transplants trying to understand how do we use these kidneys better and how to prevent scarring and, and, and diagnosis as well so many many research projects right now about 45 that are ongoing through our program so there's something you said there that is the first time time i've heard of it and i'm sure mm -hmm. some people at st mike's might be very familiar with it but did i hear you correctly when you said that st mike's has developed a system where somebody that's you know b blood can donate to somebody that's a or I don't know, and I, I don't even know which which blood groups are compatible, but with right. absolutely incompatible bloods. Yeah. So, in fairness, we didn't develop it. Uh, we we borrowed the technology from from Sweden, but um, uh, it's a very special filter that we use with our uh, machine that exchanges plasma. And basically, to put it quite simply, if someone is a donor whose blood group is A and the recipient is B, we cannot transplant those that kidney because the kidney would reject immediately. So what this column does is it actually hooks up to the patient's blood like dialysis and it kind of binds the antibodies against the blood group A in this case, like a sponge, so that the recipient does not have the antibodies when they get the transplant from the incompatible donor. So um, we are the only program in all of North America. It's actually not approved in the United States. It is approved in Canada, but um, we've, we've shared our experience across, across the country and across uh, states and uh, getting it published shortly so uh, we're very proud of that that's amazing that's incredible and it's, it's a real testament to the kind of work that's being done at st mike's kidney program or within st mike's kidneys program we have a lot of questions from a lot of participants and i hope they so the other them. thing is that yeah. no I'm go sorry. ahead yeah so I, as i said we've got uh one of the largest kidney programs in the country um uh, our current space at St. Michael's is very limited. So part of this is raising awareness. We, we're on campaign to build a brand new clinic that allows us to look after patients in, in, a, in a good space. It'll help us uh, conduct our clinical research because we do it right in our clinic for the most part uh, and really look after both uh, kidney patients who've had a transplant and those patients who are uh, getting close to needing uh, either dialysis or a transplant. And that's, that's really, really important for us as well. We look forward to that day when that happens. Hopefully it'll happen very, very soon. Um, we have a lot of people that are very eager to ask some questions. So I hope you don't mind. We'll get a flip to some of the questions from our audience now. And this question comes from Brian Harvey. And he asks, because people who have received a transplant take immunosuppressors, are we essentially not out of the water until a vaccine is discovered and made available? Yeah. So it's not a question of being out of the water. I think everybody still needs to practice social distancing as described and wearing a mask when, when you, you know, when you're in a confined space. But there's no doubt that patients who are on immunosuppressive medications, as are all transplant patients, these drugs lower the immune system so the kidney is not rejected. Uh, but that means that if you were exposed to infections and COVID being an infection, a virus infection, the, there is a higher risk of getting sick and even, um, and, and even not surviving compared to some in the same age without without transplant drugs. So I don't think we have to, um, I mean, it'd be nice when a vaccine comes, but I think it's gonna require caution, whether you're at work or socializing, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you, you take all the precautions that have been outlined by our public health people. So really just really maintaining that hand washing, hand sanitizing, social yeah. distancing, trying to stay away from people, stay home when you can, 
just yeah. everything that we've been hearing over and over for the past couple of months. Right. And it doesn't mean you have to stay in your house. And, and there are transplant patients who are working the like QR and, uh, and uh, you know, but it, it does require a little bit extra caution and, and be aware that if you get a, if you develop symptoms, uh, not to wait, because things can progress quicker in some subsets of patients. That's very good to know and a good warning to heed. Uh, this question comes to us from Eve Gordon. Am I able to go to Nova Scotia to a summer cottage this summer if the provinces open up? So that means that Nova Scotia has to let Ontarians in, I guess. Right. But, but the answer is yes. Um, there's no additional risk to you. Uh, I think it depends on whether they want us there or not. But um, the answer, of course, I, there's no reason why people who've had a transplant can't go to a cottage and enjoy uh, the outdoors and enjoy the good weather. Um, and going to Nova Scotia or anywhere else, uh, I don't think it really makes much of a difference, to be quite honest. So the answer for sure is yes. That's awesome. Um, from David Chow. Is a transplant recipient able to donate blood? And if yes, how long after transplant? And I gotta say, I've been wondering this as well. Yeah, so um, the answer unfortunately is no. And it's not that your blood is not good or healthy um, or that you're not healthy, but um, Canadian blood services are, are very, very, um, they're big sticklers, uh, rightly so, about um, people who donate blood not to have certain medications that they're taking. Uh, so that, that's a whole list of medications that they screen for. The anti-rejection drugs that a lot of transplant patients take, of course, they're in their blood. And there are some medications that actually can be, uh, not that they'd be harmful to the recipient, but some anti-rejection drugs can actually be harmful to, for example, a growing fetus. Um, uh, and, and that's something that we would want to be aware of. So unfortunately, owing to the medications that people have to take, they cannot be blood donors. So from Ingrid Turner now, considering the recent pandemic, has there been less kidney transplants performed in the GTA? But I'll expand this to say Ontario, and I know you've touched on this, but do you think overall, including with deceased donors? Yes, so um, all the programs in Ontario that do kidney transplants have been working very closely together. St. Michael's actually did the last transplant before things shut down. That was a living donor that we had planned and uh, got it through just before things shut down. Uh, from a, about an eight week period of time from mid-March till really almost uh, early mid-May, uh, the only transplants that were being done or would be done would be those uh, recipients who really were very, very high risk for needing a kidney quickly or those people who it was very hard to find a match for and that may have been their only chance. It turned out during that period of time there were no kidney transplants done anywhere in Ontario. And as I said, a, a few weeks ago, we opened up and we're doing it in phases uh, living donor has not living donor transplants have not started, but slowly but surely we are increasing our transplant activity. We've already done about seven in St. Michael's since we've opened up again, and uh, that's true for most of the programs uh, across the province. Now, I think that this is a really relevant question. I know that my clinics have been done. Um, I actually miss going in for my post transplant clinic now, um, you know, and I've been doing mine over the phone. But that's not always possible if if you're a fresh transplant recipient. And this question comes to us uh, from Cam Grant, who says, what precautions should we be taking or expect uh, for post-transplant patients while they're getting their blood work done or visiting the clinic? And what should they do if they don't appear to be followed um, when they're arriving or if it's just too crowded? Because I know that a lot of times the clinics can be quite crowded. Right. So there's a lot in that question. Um, uh, Doctors like myself who look after kidney transplant patients are very much reliant on getting regular blood work done. And if you're a fresh transplant, that blood work is done very frequently, but as time goes by, less so. Nonetheless, um, we encourage all transplant patients to get their blood done. The labs are, are being extra cautious and maintaining social distancing. We expect people to wear masks there. So I would have no concerns of going to any, any uh, lab in the province to get your blood work done. With respect to clinics, again, um, the province is slowly opening up. To re Directive 2 uh, was just um, stopped last night. Directive 2 basically told all the hospitals that you can only do a real urgent or emergent care and limit your clinics to very few numbers. So slowly but surely, the hospitals are trying to get back into surgery and clinics. Regardless, um, in our program, we, are, we have always been seeing new transplant patients directly in person or those with problems, um, and, um, and we've had a number of those that have come through. Having said that, a number of patients, the, uh, about half patients that we're seeing virtually by Zoom or by, uh, by phone visits, 
and uh, it's actually worked out pretty well. So I think that's going to continue. Transpond visits with your with your team wherever you are in the province needs to continue either virtually or if you really need to then in person and I think every program would make allowances for that. And what I will say I'm just going to add to this is um, I, I've been able to get my blood work done at Life Labs now and the first time I went in during this pandemic, I was petrified that there'd be, you know, the big lineups and things like that. And I think for the first time ever, I've been in and out in five minutes because nobody else seems to be getting blood work done. So uh, they were very cautious. There was a lot of precautions being taken um, at the life labs that I use, but it was quite nice because for the first time in a long time, no lineups at all. Um, from Laura Henriquez, is this information relevant for child nephrotic syndrome? Right. So for those who don't know that nephrotic syndrome is, is a kidney disease where the kidneys, um, they have uh, disease in the filtering units. There's about a million filtering units in each kidney. That's what the kidneys do. They filter the blood. And in nephrotic syndrome, the, um, the filtration units are not working well. So uh, the kidneys leak out protein and people get very swollen because their body retains salt and water. And there's lots of causes for that. Too many to mention here. If in fact um, the treatment for the nephrotic syndrome, and it often is the case, involves immunosuppressive medication similar to what transplant patient gets, then yes, those, those patients uh, do have to take extra precautions if they're getting medications such as prednisone or cyclosporin or myfortic, some of the same drugs that, uh, that are used for transplant patients, so yes. And, and speaking of those drugs, a lot of people have asked us, is there a concern that there could be a shortage of drugs for kidney transplant recipients? Yeah, great question. Uh, the answer, thankfully, is no, at least not that we've seen. Uh, we, recently, we've had a lot of shortages of, of many generic drugs, um, a lot of blood pressure medications, and that's actually caused some constraint, not just for transplants, but across the board, especially for people who have high blood pressure. The, um, the, to, to date, um, some of the main uh, drugs that are used in transplant, um, tacrolimus, um, um, is, is there's plenty of supply around the world, and uh, drugs like prednisone and myfortic and Celsept to date are all uh, well stocked as far as I'm aware. So the answer, thankfully, at least today, is no. From Patricia Valdez. She says, or she writes, I don't have chronic kidney disease, but I do have a kidney with a function of only 24%, as mm. well as a few cysts. Do I fall in the same category as, the, as somebody with the chronic disease? Yeah, so not knowing everything else or anything else about you, um, one of the reasons that we worry about kidney patients, dialysis patients, and people with chronic kidney disease is that uh, from COVID, when we looked at who's at risk, um, in addition to people who are immunosuppressed and the older population, those are obviously are the, the latter being the highest risk group, we found that uh, very early on, those patients with high blood pressure or diabetes um, uh, are, were also at higher risk. So high blood pressure, diabetes, um, age uh, made an, an, uh, were an issue. And many, many patients, unfortunately, with kidney disease have those conditions. Having just low kidney function without high blood pressure in and of itself is probably not an extra risk that we've been able to, to ascertain. But unfortunately, many people with, with kidney disease, even for those who are not yet on dialysis or with a transplant, do have high blood pressure, which in and of itself is a bit of a risk for um, COVID issues. So can COVID actually attack otherwise healthy, perfectly healthy kidneys? Yeah. So that was, uh, that's a good question. And in fact, that's what we we're seeing currently right now in a lot of ICUs um, in the country. And right now I'm on service at St. Michael. So I'm actually looking after patients in our ICU who've been there for weeks, who came in with perfectly normal kidneys and are on daily dialysis. So COVID can attack the kidneys in, many, in a number of ways. Uh, number one, uh, you've, some people may have heard about the fact that small blood vessels or even larger blood vessels seem to be um, a target for COVID. And uh, that may be due to a receptor on the blood vessels that line many, many body parts, including the heart and the kidneys. So we've seen out of, um, unfortunately, autopsy data from China, where they looked at patients who died and ultimately looked at their kidneys, that they did see clots within the kidneys, within the filtering unit. So that's one aspect. In addition, um, when people get very, very sick and, in, and are in the ICU and they get infection and their blood pressure goes down, then the kidneys take a hit that way. 
So the answer is there's probably direct and indirect targets of the kidney for those patients who get quite sick. And unfortunately, for patients, even with normal kidneys who get sick with COVID and end up with kidney failure and are in the ICU, they have the worst prognosis of anybody um, so far that we've seen. This is really scary information. Thank you, Dr. Zaltzman. But Dave, Dave, what are you doing to make sure that you're safe during this pandemic? <laughs> yeah, I'm obviously staying at home, staying at home as much as you can, trying to stay away from the crowds, obviously, like the busy stores and, and whatnot. I, I, but I stay fit. You know, every night I'm out riding my bike or rollerblading and kind of uh, just doing my own thing. So I'm not kind of stuck at home the whole time. But obviously, if you go out somewhere, you want to keep yourself safe, you know, wear your mask or your gloves or whatnot. Uh, just social distance. I just try and stay away uh, as much as possible. Do you find that you have more sanitizer in more places? I mean, all of a sudden, I, I, I always had it since my transplant. I've had quite a few bottles laying around the house, but now I've got way more, like three in my purse I find sometimes or, you know, my glove box. I mean, they're everywhere now. Yeah, I have countless bottles of hand sanitizer. And every time I go out anywhere, right back, I have sanitizer in the truck, uh, use that right away and then get home and then wash my hands right after that as well. So extra precautions for sure. Um, your diet, I know that it had to change at least slightly while you're on, you know, uh, which changed I'm sure dramatically while you're on dialysis, but how has it changed post-transplant and post-recovery? Like I know it's, I'm, I'm asking you to go back here quite some years, but yeah. what's, what's the way that you've been able to keep so healthy and fit? Well, I can tell you the first thing I wanted when I got home after I transplant was uh, Swiss LA chicken and ribs. So I made sure I had that. Uh, that was a meal I was looking forward to the whole time. I don't know why, but uh, it's something I wanted and, and I had it. But uh, yeah, I, I'm just naturally, I think, uh, kind of a healthier. Obviously, I have a little bit of a sweet tooth. I'm sure a lot of people have their own thing, but uh, I try and stay fairly healthy, like a meat and vegetable kind of guy and, and a, lot of, a lot of water. I uh, just try and stay away from a lot of the junky foods and, uh, you know, a lot of exercise. For me, I think, if, you know, being at home and not being able to exercise like I normally do, playing a lot of hockey, uh, you notice how much that exercise really kind of helps your body. It's kind of hard when you, you feel like you're stagnant sometimes staying at home and not being able to get that exercise in, but I just push myself to get outside and do something. No, that, that's good advice, though, because I think it's good for your people's mental health at this time as well, yeah. right? To make sure you just stay active, even if it is just walking around the block or walking up and down the stairs in your place over and over again, just to get some sort of cardio, some sort of movement going. I've got, I know you've been asked this by probably every media outlet all across North America, but how did it feel to beat the Leafs? <laughs> I had mixed emotions, to be honest, you know. Uh, a lot of people in that organization have treated me uh, great since, you know, the eight years. Uh, there's so many really, really nice people in that organization. The players are awesome. They're all nice guys. So you get out there and you, you kind of you have to do your thing. You know, they score two goals on me and, uh, and then you got to block out who you're playing against. You just got to play. So Carolina played fantastic in that game. So I, I definitely, it wasn't me. <laughs> it was it was a lot of them. Uh, I think but it was a lot of you too. I think it was a lot of you too. It was a lot of fun though, that's for sure. Now, since you're kind of on a winning streak here, and we know that the Leafs are going to be at least in the playoffs this year under this new system, um, how many years until they bring the cup home? Ooh, wouldn't it be cool if they did it this year? It would be kind of a, a different uh, scenario and they bring it home now. But I think they're turning the corner really well. they got a lot of young uh, players there that are fantastic, and the coaches and, the, and all their staff are great. So I, I'm going to say five years. Within five years, I think they're going to take it. No, it's awesome. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, their new coach, I'm just, just throwing it out there. I went to the same high school as him. So, you know, <laughs> he must be really great. Is, is my he's, an ama he's an amazing guy and a really smart coach. So I think he's going to do well with them. That's awesome. Thanks so much. And thank you so much for, for help sharing your story, but showing what, what good people can do after a transplant, right? That they're not mm -hmm. bound to be, you know, lethargic or they're not going to be able to be fit and, and for really putting a spotlight on kidney disease and organ donation. I think what you've been doing is fantastic. And Dr. Zaltzman, thank you so much for all of your fantastic information and for keeping us all informed and for keeping so many patients healthy. I think it's just invaluable and tackling questions that, you know, you don't always necessarily know what's coming. You've been very, very informative. Now I'm going to head this over to Nikki Eaton. She's going to take the floor over to you, Nikki. Thank you, Christina, and what a great conversation. And thank you all uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, Dr. Saltzman, uh, your expertise is always welcome and very interesting. And Dave, 
well, you captured all of us. Whether we're Leaf fans, have fans, your story captured all of us. Um, I'm Nikki Eaton. I'm a board member at St. Michael's Hospital Foundation. I co-chair the campaign with Tim Griffin. And I'm also a donor, a kidney donor. Um, last year, St. Michael's, as Dr. Saltzman said, celebrated its 50th anniversary of, kidney of its kidney transplant program. And we are looking forward at St. Mike's to see what Dr. Saltzman and his team will do next, not just getting us through this pandemic, which is very interesting. I didn't realize that you wouldn't have kidney disease and then the virus hits and all of a sudden you do have kidney disease. I think that was very, very interesting for a lot of us. And also uh, what you have, what we all have to look forward to, you and your team, what you're gonna help kidney transplant recipients live longer and healthier lives. Christina and Dave are both very testament to St. Michael's care. We are currently in a fundraising campaign to build a state-of-the-art facility, which Dr. Saltzman talked about. Please check out our website if you think you can help us. We would appreciate it. Last but not least, thank you to my fellow cabinet members, Tim Griffin, Barbara Polk, Jamie Watt, Ten Macklin. And I think all together, you, listening to us tonight and we at St. Mike's can make life easier and better for all those suffering from kidney disease. Thank you very much again. Good night.